All right, well, on this episode, we're going to be continuing our discussion of Romans and zeroing in our attention <clears throat> on Romans chapter 7, uh, chapter 7 and 8. Um, last time we were looking, just kind of took a summary view of chapters 1 through 6 to work our way to chapter 7. And let me just go ahead and read to you the the actual passage in question here. I read part of this last week and then, but now I want to read that part and the rest of chapter seven, just so you have an idea of what we're talking about here. So I'm going to start in verse 14 of Romans chapter seven, in which it says, and this is Paul speaking, he says, for we know that the law is spiritual, but I am of the flesh sold under sin for I do not understand my own actions for I do not do what I want, but I do the very thing I hate. Now, if I do what I do not want, I agree with the law that it is good. So now it is no longer I who do it, but sin that dwells within me. For I know that nothing good dwells in me, that is, in my flesh. For I have the, for I have the desire to do what is right, but not the ability to carry it out. For I do not do the, the good I want, but the evil I do not want is what I keep on doing. Now, I, now if I do, turn the page here. <laughs> For if I do what I do not want to, what I do not want, it is no longer I who do it, but sin that dwells within me. So I, so I find, so I find it to be a law that when I want to be, when I want to do right, evil lies close at hand. For I delight in the law of God in my inner being, but I see in my members another law waging war against the law of my mind and making me captive to the law of sin that dwells in my members. Wretched man that I am, who will deliver me from this body of death? Thanks be to God through Jesus Christ our Lord. So then, I myself serve the law of God with my mind, but with my flesh I serve the law of sin. Okay, and so, like I said, last time we were working our way uh, through chapters one, uh, chapters one through six, just hitting the highlights there to get it so you can get a, a little bit of an idea of the direction that Paul is going leading up to chapter 7 and the point that I'm that I'm wanting to make here um in looking at chapter 7 again this is a, this is part of a semi break we're taking from the book of Galatians uh meaning that we're not looking at the text of Galatians but we're looking at things that are related to Galatians and last time we were in Galatians a couple of weeks ago we were talking about chapter 3 verse 10 where it says uh, all those who rely on works of the law um are under a curse you know, because it says blessed, are, uh, excuse me, not blessed, cursed are those who do not con continue to abide in the word uh, with what is written in the book of the law and do them. OK. And so in looking at Romans, Paul, I want to point out how Paul paints a picture of somebody who essentially is relying on on the law and seeing that as their salvation and seeing their works as their salvation. When really Paul, all Paul is saying is that the law really doesn't save us and it really doesn't. Uh, you know, provide us with anything to give us the ability to to save ourselves. It really just shows us uh, what sin is and really how sinful we are. And then he's going to take us through that cycle and saying, "I do what I do not want to do," and 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 that sort of thing. Um, and a big part of of what we talked about last time, and even what we're going to look at now in this episode, is looking at this in the way that I, I truly believe that Paul is intending his readers, his audience, to look at this through. And that is the the picture of what it looks like for an unbeliever who is who thinks that he or she is justified by the law. So in other words, I'm going against what I think a large majority of people think as it relates to Romans chapter 7 and that part that I just read to you um, in that, you know, they would say that Paul is talking about um, his struggle as a Christian um, and by extension, the, the struggle that we ourselves as believers in Christ have is, uh, with sin. And I made the point last time and will continue to make it now um, that, you know, that that mindset, you know, saying that Paul is looking at this through the eyes of a believer and a believer struggle with sin doesn't make any sense. OK, um, and so I, I don't have time to go through all of the all the specific details in our overview of chapters one through six. So I would encourage you, if you haven't listened to that, uh, to go back to that episode and listen to it again. And if it's been a while, maybe just listen to it again. Um, but, I, you know, but I, I, I want us to understand here that, you know, Paul, Paul's intention is not to, to, uh, to show, to show us Christians the struggles that we have and that he himself has 
as a believer. In fact, that mindset really just goes against a lot of what he's been saying in the book of Romans up to this point. Okay. And so what I don't want for, for many of you um, is to look at Romans 7, looking at it through the lens of a believer and doing what I've heard a lot of Christians doing as it relates to that passage and with them nodding their heads and saying, yep, that's just kind of me. That's as a Christian, I sin and I sin all the time. And, you know, yeah, I want to do good things and blah, blah, blah. But, you know, I'm just, I'm just, I'm just a sinner. I'm just caught in that cycle of sin. And I, 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 I identify with Paul's frustration and everything and, you know, all sorts of other things that people say as it relates to that passage. Um, and th- not denying that Christians sin, Christians do sin. Um, not denying that there are times where we, you know, where we are, we have the full intention of doing the right thing. And then sometimes we slip into doing the wrong thing. I don't deny that either. Um, but Paul's intention here is different. Um, and a lot of the things that we might be thinking of as far as sin in our lives has more to do with what is written, but what Paul writes in Galatians chapter five, which is different from Romans chapter seven. And, and if I remember, I'll, I'll, I'll touch on that and go into that a little bit um, on this episode as well. But anyway, um, all that to say, we're going to be continuing on um, in our look um, of this passage and looking specifically at Romans chapter seven. Um, we're not, we're, we're not going to do an in-depth verse by verse study of this. We are going to look closer at some of the things in Romans chapter seven, because again, Listen, we don't have we don't have the time and, uh, of to go into minute detail on a lot of things. And really, what I hope to do is get back into Galatians next episode. Okay, um, that's the goal here. So, uh, but we will look at at some of the features here in Romans chapter seven. We'll also answer some of the objections that people on the other side have uh, to this in saying that this passage can't be talking about the uh, the display of an unbeliever who's who's in a cycle of sin and that sort of thing. So we'll talk about two or three of those and answer those as well. Um, so we have a lot in store. I feel like I've already said a lot already up to this point. Um, so we're going to get into this. So a lot of good things in store. I hope you stay with us. My name is Steve Gill and you're listening to Loving the Scriptures. And so just to warn you, as you know, just before we, we go on, just to warn you, I, I feel I feel some, some sneezing fits coming up. Um, I've restrained myself thus far, and I think I hopefully I'll, I'll be successful as we go through this episode. But I'll ask you to excuse me in advance if I have to pause and let out a series of sneezes. If you remember, I had to do that a few weeks ago um, on, on one of the episodes not too long ago where I was just suddenly overcome with a series of sneezes. Um, and, you know, really, in, in all in all reality, I could edit those out. Um, but I, I, I don't want to take the time to, to really do that because I'm not all that great at editing. And, uh, you know, I, I, I just, I'm just afraid that when I do, I, you know, I might make it sound funny, um, you know, just when I have to cut certain things out and I have to continue things in and, and, and what have you. So, um, I just leave those in there, you know, sneezing is natural. Um, you know, and it's just, you know, that's, it's just something that happens from time to time. So, um, so yeah, but actually as I'm talking now, I'm feeling a little bit better. It's kind of gone away. So I don't anticipate any sneezing interruptions or, or anything like that. So that's, uh, so that's a good thing. So, because we have a lot to, to go through here, um, again, like I said a few minutes ago, um, what I would encourage you to do is if you haven't listened to part one, go ahead and listen to part one before listening here to part two, um, because I'm not going to spend a lot of time in detail going over the highlights that I went over last time when, when looking at chapters one through six. What I do want to do, though, um, I, I debated with myself whether I wanted to do this or not. Um, earlier, and I think I am going to. I'm going to. I am going to read through chapter six. Now, I might pause to make a couple of brief comments here and there, maybe um, as I read through this. We'll see how this goes. But the reason why I want to read through chapter six is because if you remember last time, I said that chapter six is 
huge as far as our understanding of Romans chapter seven and what and what Paul is really trying to get at when he's when he goes into the whole thing of I do what I do not want to do um, sort of thing. Um, and it, really what it comes down to is slavery language. And really what it comes down to is distinguishing between two groups of people, those who are slaves to sin and those who are not. And those who aren't slaves to sin, they're sl- sin, they're slaves to God and slaves to righteousness. Okay. And if we have that as our, as, as a, you know, just kind of something that's at the forefront of our minds as we go into chapter seven, um, I think you're you're in a better position to understand what what Paul is trying to communicate there in Romans chapter seven. So let me start out. Let's let's read uh, starting at verse one of chapter six, and it says, "What shall we say then? Are we to continue in sin that grace may abound? By no means. How can we who died to sin still live in it? Do you not know that all who all of us who have been baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into His death?" We were buried, therefore, with him by baptism into death in order that just as just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the father, we, too, might walk in newness of life. For if we have been united with him in his death, in a death like his, we shall certainly be united with him in a resurrection like his. We know that our old self was crucified with with him in order that the body of sin might be brought to nothing so that we would no longer be enslaved to sin for for one who has who has died has been has been set free from sin now we have di- now if we have died with Christ we believe we will also live with him we know that Christ being raised from the dead will never die again death no longer has dominion over him for the death he died he died to sin once for all but the life he lives he lives to God so you also must consider yourselves dead to sin and alive to God in Christ Jesus. Let not sin therefore reign in your mortal body to make you, to make you obey its passions. Do not present the, your members to sin as instruments of unrighteousness, but present yourselves to God as those who have been brought from death to life and your members to God as instruments of righteousness. For sin will, not, will have no dominion over you since you are not under law but under grace. What then? Are we to sin because we are not under law, but under grace? By no means. Do you not know that if you present yourselves to anyone as obedient slaves, you are slaves to the one whom you obey, either of sin, which leads to death, or of obedience, which leads to righteousness? But thanks be to God that you who were once, who were once slaves of sin have become obedient from the heart, from the heart to the standard of living to which you were committed, and having been set free from sin, have become slaves of righteousness. I am speaking in human terms because of your natural limitations. For just as you once, just as you once uh, presented your members as slaves to impurity and to lawlessness, leading to more lawlessness, so now present your members as slaves to righteousness, leading to sanctification. For when you were slaves of sin, you were you were free in regard to righteousness. But what fruit were you were you getting at that time when the th- uh, from the things that you are now ashamed? For the for the end of those things is death. But now that we have been set free from sin and have become slaves to God, the fruit you get leads to sanctification and its end, eternal life. For the wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. Okay. So hopefully you see, and again, one of the the big things that I majored on here was the fact that Paul's making a a distinction between, you know, what, what type of slavery there is. There's slavery to sin, which he says leads to death and there's slavery to God, which leads to righteousness. Okay. And specifically in that, in, in that, uh, in verse 22, it says, but now that you have been set free from sin and have become slaves to God, the fruit you get leads to sanctification. And again, I want you to, to hang on to that, you know, the, the, the progressive transformation into the likeness of Christ, into the image of Christ, you know, that's what we get. You know, we have become slaves to God. The fruit you get leads to sanctification and its end eternal life. So the distinctions that he makes here are, are pretty clear. And as you go into, into chapter 7, it be, I think it becomes all the more clear. 
basically, again, he's been saying that you are not slaves to sin. If you are in Christ, you are you have been set free. Okay, he talks about being slaves to sin, which is the old way. And he says that we have been set free, which indicates that we were slaves at one point, but now that we've been set free, therefore we are no longer slaves to sin. This is very, very important so that we to understand what Paul is getting at in Romans chapter 7. Now, we did go into the first six verses of chapter 7, and I want to reread that again, starting in verse 1, where he says, Or do you not know, brothers, for I am speaking to those who know the law, that the law is binding on a person only as long as he lives? For a married woman is bound by law to her husband while, she, while he lives, but if, she, but if her husband dies, she is released from the law of marriage. Accordingly, she will be called an adulteress if she lives with another man while her husband is alive. But if her husband dies, she is free from, the, from that law. And if she marries another man, she is not an adulteress. Likewise, my brothers, you also have died to the law through the body of Christ so that you may belong to another, to him who has been raised from the dead in order that we may bear fruit for God. Now, remember bearing fruit for God. That's the purpose of everything that's going on here, what we're talking about here. We've died to the law so that we can belong to another, so that we can belong to Christ. Why? Uh, why, do, why, do we, why, why do we want that? In order that we may bear fruit for God. Okay. Now, how do we bear fruit for God? Well, Paul is going to make it clear. It's, we can't bear fruit for God on our own. Because we have a we have a sin nature that will do it, that if you're in if you're under the law, um, and and you don't have Jesus Christ, your sinful nature really has dominion over you and will not allow you to bear fruit for God. I mean, essentially, that's what he's going to demonstrate. Okay, um, in verse five, he says, "For while we, for, for while we were living in the flesh, which again he's he's going back to." looking back to the old way of life, how things were, he says, our sinful passions aroused by the law. Now that's important. We're at work in our members to bear fruit for death. Okay. Now, remember, we're talking about this whole thing about bearing fruit for God and bearing fruit for death. Remember, and I pointed this out last time that at the end of chapter six, he talks about this whole thing of, of bearing fruit. You know, what fruit did, were you getting at that time from the things that you are, uh, of which you are now ashamed? For the end of those things is death. But now, verse 22, that you have been set free, in other words, no longer slaves, uh, now that you've been set free from sin and have become slaves to God, so you see the distinction that's being made there, the fruit that you get leads to sanctification and its end, eternal life. That's, the, that's what Paul says earlier in verse 4 when he's talking about bearing fruit for God. Whereas before, he says, before that time you were bearing fruit for death. Now, verse 6 of chapter 7, he says, But now we are released from the law, having died to that which held us captive, so that we serve in the new way of the Spirit and not in the old way of the written code. And like I told you last time, verse 6 is incredibly, incredibly, incredibly important to understand. Because what, what Paul is going is to proceed to do, he's, gonna, he's, he's made the distinction here at the end of verse 6. And now he's going to demonstrate what, that, what that's all about in the rest of chapter 7 and in chapter 8. Chapter 7 is going to talk about what it looks like to be under the old way of the written code. Chapter 8 is going to talk about the new way of the Spirit, okay? And in case you didn't catch it, I think there were there were a couple of times last episode where I got those things mixed up, and that's just misspeaking. I know, Hopefully you know what I was trying to say and what I was trying to communicate, but I think that there were a couple of times where I said the old way of the Spirit and the new way of the written code. <laughs> I got that backwards. No, no. It's the new way of the Spirit as opposed to the old way of the written code, Okay. Um, and so that's what we're dealing with here. Now, I, I, I don't remember. I think I may have made the connection with what we saw there in verse six to uh, to something we saw at the end of chapter two. Remember where he's talking about the you know circumcision that's inward as opposed to a circumcision that's outward and physical. And remember in chapter two, verse nine, he says, but a Jew is one inwardly and circumcision is a matter of the heart. Listen, by the spirit, in other words, the Holy Spirit, by the spirit not by the letter, okay? And I think in a certain sense we get the same we get the same substance here in in chapters in chapter 7 verse 6 
where he's talking about we serve in the new way of the spirit and not in the old way of the written code. And really, if you think about it, I mean, th- doesn't this in some way uh, go along the lines of what we see in Ezekiel chapter 36? Now, Ezekiel 36 is a, is a passage that I think a lot of Christians are familiar with. So I'm not going to be bringing up anything here that's, um, that's unfamiliar to a lot of people. A lot of us are familiar with uh, Ezekiel chapter 26, uh, excuse, uh, excuse me, 36. And then when you look at verse 26, it says, I will give you a new heart and a new spirit I will put within you. And I will remove your heart of stone from your flesh and give you a heart of flesh. Now, listen, verse 27, and I will put my spirit, in other words, the Holy Spirit, I will put my spirit within you and cause you to walk in my statutes and be careful to obey my rules. Okay, now that's what happens when when somebody is transformed and when they have the spirit. And so a lot of people like to quote Ezekiel 36 and and I would agree with them and just the outlook on what and what's being laid out there in Ezekiel 36. But then for some reason, when we get to Romans seven, we look at Paul saying, I do what I do not want to do what I hate to do. And we say, yep, that's our that's our uh, that's our that's our reality as as believers. And like, wait a minute. But you have that, and then you have Ezekiel 36, where he's talking about, I will remove your heart of stone and give you a heart of flesh, and and I will put my spirit within you, and I will, and I will make you, lead you to, to, to follow my rules, um, as it says there. I don't want to butcher that again. What is he say? And I will put my spirit within you and cause you to walk in my statutes and be careful to obey my rules. That, to me, sounds like the new way of the, new way of the spirit. And in the new way of the spirit, he causes you to, to walk in his statutes and to be careful to follow his rules perfectly. No. And we'll, and we'll talk and we'll see why, and, and we'll see, you know, just how this isn't talking about perfection of conduct, but there is a change that's happened. Regeneration has taken place. You have a new spirit, you know, as an in inner spirit, because you've been transformed, you're a new creature and he's put the Holy spirit within you. Okay. So, you know, I think there's a lot to be said about that. I mean, again, just considering Romans seven six, where he makes the distinction between the new way of the spirit and the old and and, and the old way of the written code. Okay. Now, as we go further, as we proceed further here, you know, all this talk about the new way of the spirit, the old way of the written code, how people who are under the law uh, are dominated by sin. Sin is is. Uh, uh, if you're under the law, then you're under the dominion of sin and that sort of thing. All this talk leading up to this point could lead somebody to ask at, the, at this point, is the law sin? And that and Paul anticipates that question in the minds of his readers. And so that's why he addresses that. He says in verse 7, he says, uh, What then shall we say? That the law is sin? By no means. Yet it had not. Uh, yet if it had not been for the law, I would not have known, uh, I would not have known sin. For I would not have known what it is to covet if the law had not, if the law had said, excuse me, I'm reading that funny. For I would not have known what it is to covet if the law had not said, you shall not covet. Okay. So remember, this points us back to what we, what we looked at before Um, in chapter three, at the end of chapter three and in verse 20, he says, for by works of the law, no human being will be justified by uh, in his sight, since through the law comes knowledge of sin. So Paul is, is highlighting that that truth here. Uh, what, what he just mentioned in chapter three, he's highlighting it again here. And he's going to and he, and he inserts himself in here as an example um, of this. He says, for I would not have known what it is to covet if the law had not said you should you shall not covet. But then he goes on to say, but sin seizing an opportunity through the commandment produced in me all kinds of covet- uh, covetousness for apart from law, sin lies dead. Now, here's something that's very important to recognize here. So he's this is going to be a lead in to everything that he's going that he's going to continue to say in verses 14 and following. OK, now, if you know, if we're talking about how are we looking at Paul in verse 14 and following in chapter seven? You know, do we look at that as a struggle of a, of a Christian or a, or a portrait of, 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 of an unbeliever who's trying to find a justification under the law? Ask yourself this question. When Paul uses himself as an example in the verses that I read there and says that I wouldn't have known what coveting was 
if the law hadn't said do not covet, let's ask this question. Was Paul a believer or an unbeliever when he learned the law? And he learned specifically the law do not covet, the, the commandment do not covet. Now, if, we, if we're familiar, familiar with Paul's past, if we're familiar with his resume, we understand that as a Pharisee, of course, he was, he was, uh, he was very familiar with the law before he came to Christ. Many Jews before coming to Christ, many Jews who became Christians knew of the law before they came to Christ, right? And Paul was no exception. In fact, Paul's knowledge um, in things of the law exceeded those of his own, of his own brethren and people of his own age, right? You, he, he says so, he says as much in, uh, you know, we saw that in Galatians, uh, when, uh, in, in Galatians 1, when we were studying that part, we see, he says the same thing in Philippians chapter 3, all right? So, Paul, as an unbeliever, is exp- was exposed to law, had great training under the law, under, the, under Rabbi Gamaliel, as he himself testifies in the book of Acts, right? So Paul is presenting an example here of something that happened when he was an unbeliever. And what he's going to proceed to do is say that as an unbeliever, the knowledge of sin doesn't save you. And having the law, hearing the law, and that sort of thing doesn't save you. Right conduct under the law doesn't save you because what you what you tend to learn once you're exposed to the law is that, you the, the, again, what sin is and how sinful you really are. That's the whole thing. And he says, so even in verse eight, he says, but sin seizing an opportunity through the commandment produced in me all kinds of covetousness. Okay. So let's get one thing straight here though, just to, just to cover again, what's laid out here. Cause it, it it sounds like this, this would be something, what it sounds like if somebody's just passing the buck, uh, but sin seizing the opportunity through the commandment and producing me all kinds of uh, all kinds of covetousness. Later on, he's going to say, and you might have noticed it as we read through, um, that he says it's no longer I who do it, but it's sin. You know, it sounds like somebody who's passing the buck. Goes, no, 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 it wasn't me. It's not me. It, it's sin. Blame sin. You know that sort of thing. What's he talking about here? Well, I think you know when you later on get get to the part where where Paul is talking about the flesh. That's basically what we're what we're talking about here. So we're going to make the connection here a little in a little bit here between sin and the flesh. The flesh being just another way of, of talking about the sinful nature. Okay, and Paul's exposure to the law is going to awaken the sinful nature within him. Okay, and that's what he's then that's what he's going to be saying there. So the at the end of of, of verse eight there he says, "For apart from the law, sin is dead, right? Or, or sin lies dead." Now is that saying? Does that mean that? Uh, apart from the law or like if the law hadn't been in existence or if I had never been exposed to the law, I would have been one who never sinned. No, that's not what he's saying either. Obviously, sin existed before the law came. You know, Paul even says that in Romans chapter five, you know, in in, in the days of Noah, it says that people's you know, thoughts or the thoughts of man were were were, uh, were sinful continuously um, and that sort of thing. Actually, I want to read that there just real quick. This is well before the law um, in, in Genesis chapter six, verse five, the Lord saw that the wickedness of man was great on, in the earth and that every intention of the thoughts of his heart was, was only evil continually. Okay. So obviously that's well before the law. And so, you know, we know that before the law sin existed. So the fact that Paul says that sin lies dead, isn't him saying that, you know, sin wasn't a thing before the law. What he's saying, though, is that what the distinction that he's making there is of awareness. When he's talking about sin coming alive and that sort of thing, it has to do with the awareness that he now has of sin. Again, of knowing what sin is uh, in a very explicit way, because the commandments are saying, you shall not do this, you shall not do this, you shall not do this, you shall not do this. And he specifically uses the, the example of coveting. Um, he says, I wouldn't have known what coveting was if the law had said, not said, do not covet. But now that I do know what coveting is, you know, sin just kind of springs to life. And really when he talks about this, it, it's in a way as if so as to demonstrate just how sinful and how wicked of a person you are. Even when you're exposed to that, which is good, you and your sinfulness springs to life and say, I want to do the opposite of that. Okay. Let's continue on here. Verse nine, he says, I was, I was once alive apart from the, uh, apart from the law. And again, that's just, you know, his way of saying, you know, I thought I was doing okay. 
before before exposed to the law. But when the but when the commandment came, sin came alive, and I died. The very commandment that promised life proved to proved to be death to me. For sin, seizing an opportunity through the commandment, deceived me, and through it killed me. Okay, so again. All of this has to do with the matter of awareness. In fact, he's gonna he's gonna he's gonna lay that out in verse thirteen. But I want you to I want you to notice here verse twelve. He says, "For the law is holy, and the commandment is holy and righteous and good." I, I and I think that's very important to highlight that that point there, and what Paul is actually saying there. That's kind of a summary verse to answer that question that might be hanging around in people's mind. It says, uh, "Is the law sin?" And Paul is saying, no, it's not, the law isn't, isn't bad. The law isn't sin. Sin is sin. I am sinful. My flesh, nothing good it, you know, resides in there. Nothing having to do with the law. This isn't speaking anything against the law. So therefore, he's saying in verse 12, so the law is holy and the commandment is holy and righteous and good. And I think that's important to, to lay out there because I think people can get the impression that because there's so much emphasis on law versus grace, law versus faith, and making the distinctions between those two, saying that that through the law, you, no one is justified and that sort of saying all these things that are true and biblical, I think a lot of times we think, okay, maybe on even on an unconscious level, we think the law is bad. And, but Paul wouldn't be one who says that the law is bad. The, he says the law is holy and the commandment is holy and righteous and good. I think that's important to understand that because we think of anything of the law and we, we, I think a lot of times many Christians automatically think, oh, the law is bad. You know, that's, you know, stay away from law. It's grace, grace, grace. Yes, it is grace, grace, grace. Remember what he said before. He says, he says that, that we uphold the law. Now that's talking about after we come to Christ again, perfectly. No. Um, and not even totally on our, on our own, uh, you know, because again, we've been justified. And part of that justification is that Christ lived under the law and kept the law perfectly when we weren't able to. So when it comes to justification, the imputation of righteousness to our account, the righteous requirements of the law are met in us, not because of us, but because of him, because of Christ. Okay. And so we uphold the law. But even so, we think about the law. We think about do not murder, do not commit adultery, that sort of thing. Are those things good? The prohibition of those things is, is it good to not murder? Is it good to not commit adultery? Of course. So the law is good. Don't be, be careful not to fall into a trap of thinking, okay, law, bad, grace, good. Law is bad if you're, if we're talking about using that as a, as a means for salvation, but the law itself isn't bad. When it says do not murder, do not covet, do not commit adultery. You know, those, those are good prohibitions in the law. So the law is not bad, but what the law does, it shows us just how bad we are. Okay. Verse 13, it says, did that, which is good then bring death to me by no means. It was sin producing death in me through what is good in order that, okay, now listen, in order that sin might be shown to be sin. So in other words, in learning what sin is. Um, I mean, in, in a very explicit, let me say this in a, in a very explicit way, because it says earlier on in Romans, even the Gentiles have the law written on their heart. So there's somewhat of an understanding of the law, but it's not, they don't have the commandments. They didn't have the, the, the law and the commandments, you know, explicitly revealed to them. But when we do, I mean, when the Jews do, and even when you, know, if you were to approach a Gentile and saying, Hey, if you kept the 10 commandments, ideally what you would, what you would what would come from ideally, I, cause it doesn't always happen, but ideally what you would want is for somebody to see that. And they say, man, I haven't kept this. I haven't kept that commandment. I haven't, you know, you know, so forth and so on. So they could, they, they have an awareness of, of their sin. Um, as it says there, um, uh, see in order that sin might be shown to be sin and through the commandment might become sinful beyond measure. So that shows the level at which we are, by which we see, you know, just how sinful we are because we're exposed to the law and we know, you know, and again, this is if the spirit is at work in, in, in bringing to light, you know, what the law is supposed to show you, we come to understand that, man, we are, we have, we have fouled up big time when it comes to the law, um, on a continual basis, right? 
And so, and in a certain degree, I think that that's in connection to some of the things that we saw earlier in Romans chapter five, where he talks about, um, you know, the law, um, now the law came, uh, it came, um, now the law came to increase the trespass. Okay. But, but and, and there was no period there. There's a, but there, but where sin increased, grace abounded all the more. That's where we're getting to here. We're getting to the wonderful grace of uh, grace of God through Jesus Christ for people who cannot help themselves. And this is all the more supposed to show that, you know, if you're, if your whole objective is to say, okay, well, I have the law, I know the law, I listen to the law, and it's by following that law where my justification will be a reality. Paul is going to say, think again. The law, the law came to increase the trespass, and I th- and I see a certain sense of that here, where it said, where it says that, uh, where, where it says what it just said there, um, and through the commandment might become sinful beyond measure. We just we we come to an understanding of just how sinful we are. And Paul is going to even take that further and is going to demonstrate that in his further explanation in verses 14 and following. Now, verse 14 is where where I started reading at the beginning of this episode and reading through the end of chapter 7. So here's where we get into the whole I do what I do not want to do and that sort of thing. And when you read that really fast, it does sound kind of confusing, but hopefully you, you, you see what, what Paul is trying to say here. So if we're seeing all of this for what it really is, are, do you, do you, are you starting to see here how this being an explanation of Paul as Paul's struggle with sin as a believer really doesn't make a lot of sense? Again, going back to verse 6, what he's doing now, based on what we saw in verse 6, he's, he's making it, he's going to be talking about the old way of the written code here in the rest of chapter 7 and what that looks like versus the new way of the spirit in chapter eight. Okay. So in verse 14, he says, um, for we know that the law is spiritual, but I am of the flesh sold under sin. Now notice he says, for we know, we know this, we know that the law is spiritual, but there's a problem, but I am, but I am of the flesh sold under sin. So the fact that he, and this might be a small point, it might not be a huge point. And part of this is speculation, but I think that, you know, he's, you know, by appealing to his readers and saying, we know this, but I know that of of myself, I know that I am unspiritual. I think that, you know, appealing to what they know. And then Paul using the first person and saying, I'm going to demonstrate to you in example form of what it looks like for somebody who is under the old way of the written code. And I think that's important because a lot of people will say, okay, when Paul makes his description here in the following verses, he uses a, he uses a personal pronoun, I, 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 I. So obviously he's talking about himself in the present form. Look, you have to understand what he's trying to accomplish here. Okay. And we'll, and we'll talk about this here in a little bit, just kind of, you know, what, what his objective is here in a, in a second. But again, remember, but always keep in the, in the forefront of your minds, the whole thing about believers being set free from sin, which doesn't seem to be what's demonstrated here in, in, in chapter seven. And also the fact that the example that he used just a few verses before, as far as becoming knowledge, uh, becoming aware of sin, and then having all these covetous desires come up in you, is a description of Paul as an unbeliever, because Paul was exposed to the law when he was an unbeliever. Not as a believer, but as an unbeliever, okay? So... Here's what you have here. So it says, for we know that the law is spiritual, but I am of the flesh sold under sin. Now the word sold there in the original would lend to this idea. And this by, is by no means shouldn't be any surprise given what we've seen in chapter six, but the laws, Im- but the word implies in that, in that, in that verse that sold under sin is sold under slavery to sin. Okay. That's the, that's the idea. That's the idea of that word sold there, sold under sin. So what, what Paul is laying out here again is slavery language. So this is, this to me is a huge, uh, a a huge point to make in, in, in making the point and making the case that Paul is not talking about his own experience as a Christian with his struggle with sin, because if he's saying I am sold under sin, Again, what did we just see in, ch- in chapter 6? In chapter 6, he says, But now that you have been set free from sin and have become slaves to God, 
So again, if you're not a slave to sin, you're a slave to something else. And that something else or someone else is a slave to God, is a slave to God. He says, and even before he says um, in verse 14, for sin will have no dominion over you since you are not under law, but under grace. But again, and again, we just read through all of chapter six before, you know, earlier on in the episode. And again, you saw the distinguishing marks that he was making between those who are believers and those, those who are unbelievers. Those who are believers have been set free from sin. So if that's the case, as Paul clearly lays out in chapter six, then how can he in chapter seven be saying, uh, you know, uh, for, I, for we know that the law is spiritual, but I am, but I am of the flesh sold under sin. In other words, sold as a slavery to sin. After Paul has been making the point in all of chapter six, that if you're in Christ, you've been set free from sin. You see, so this can't be, this can't be Paul talking about his own experience or the experience of a Christian with sin that it can't be. But what he's doing is that he's making a demonstration of what the old way of the, uh, the old way of the written code, what that looks like. Okay. And listen, when we make examples of things, if we use things or we talk in an example form, we do this sometimes as well. You know, we, we might not be aware of it all the time because it's just so natural to us for, you know, a lot of the times, but if we're setting forth an example and we're setting up a scenario and we're putting ourselves in the scenario, I might say, okay, now I'm going to do this and I do that, you know, so forth and so on. I'm not saying that I am in reality under the conditions of whatever it is I'm speaking of. I'm using it in example form to make the point. Okay. And I really think that that's what Paul is, what Paul is doing here. Um, and that's what that's what explains the whole thing where he's saying I I I I in 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 the following verses there, so he says for uh, okay so he says I'm sold under sin, uh, verse fifteen for I do not understand my own actions for I do not do what I want but I do, but I do the very thing I hate now I do for if I do what I do not want I agree with the law that it is good. So, so now it is no longer I who do it, but sin that dwells within me. Now, again, for a lot of people that might sound like Paul is, is passing the buck here. No, 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 it's not me. It's, it's sin that, you know, whatever. And he's saying, I, it is no longer I who do it. Okay. Now what's he saying there? That seems to imply that he was doing it before. And now he's saying it is no longer I who do it, but it's sin that's living in me. Basically all I think that Paul is doing here and laying it forth in this way is that he's saying before the law, the situation for anybody would be that before the law, um, you know, their sin existed in that person's life. Now, they might not have been as aware of it apart from the law, but then when the law came and they were exposed to the law and showed them what, what the law was, and then it produced all these sinful desires based on what the law said, the sinful nature springs to life and in this is this is what happens if somebody is a slave to sin. Sin, sin, who is the master, springs in and says, "You are not to follow that." See, sin is is sin, and sin. We're talking about sin in personified terms, but obviously, sin is not a person. But again, just to lay forth the point, sin as a master and as a ruler over the person who is unregenerate springs to life when the commandment comes and says, "That's not the direction you're going." I'm your master. You're going to do what I tell you to do. So sin springs to life and says, nope, even though, even though you've really been sinning all along, but now you've been exposed to the law, the law teaches you what sin actually is. And then it brings to life all of these other desires. And to use Paul's example, again, all these covetous desires after I learned what coveting was after being exposed to the law. Okay. So he's not passing the buck. He's just he's just using this as a way to explain this is what happens if you're wanting to live under the law and be justified by the law. This is actually the reality that you're asking for. Okay. So um, verse 16, now if I do what I do not want, I agree with the law that it is good. Um, that's another, that's another uh, thing that people will raise objections to. They'll say, um, you know, the, the no one believer would say that the law is good. I, well, 
I don't agree with that. We'll, we'll touch on that in a couple of minutes here when we get to another portion of the of the passage here. But let's just put a pin in that for now. Um, but um, verse 17, so, so now it is no longer I who do it, but sin that dwells within me. Now, verse 18 here is, is, is let's take a look here. It says in verse 18, it's first, for I know that nothing good dwells in me, that is, in my flesh. For I have the desire to do uh, to do what is right, but not the ability to carry it out. Now, a couple of things. This is another area where people will say, well, this can't be Paul. Whoa, that the, the mic kind of went topsy-turvy there. My apologies. Um, so people will say this can't be Paul talking about the unbeliever. Because, again, he's using the personal pronoun I and he's saying, um, and he's saying, for I know that nothing good dwells in me, that is, in my flesh. Okay? And so the thought will be, well, well a believer, uh, an unbeliever can't make that admission that, that nothing good dwells within his flesh. I would, I would tend to disagree, um, especially if we're looking at this from a Jewish perspective. Because again, back in chapter 2, he's, he says, now if you call yourself a Jew consider this and he goes through this whole thing and so a lot of what he's been saying has a, has had a jewish uh, you know sort of understanding to it so and again the writer of hebrews would even would even lend to this idea that specifically even when it comes to the day of atonement that would that served as a as a reminder of people's sin and people's perpetual sin and that the way into the most holy place hasn't hasn't been hasn't arrived yet but it served as a reminder over and over and over again that sin is a problem. Sin is a problem. Even outside of the Day of Atonement, when it came to sacrifices because of sin, do you think that that didn't remind the offerer of that sacrifice that, they're, that they've sinned and that they're a sinner? Of course it did. To, a certain, to, to certain levels, of certain degrees, I'm, you know, I think that many of the people in the Jewish world understood that that they were that there was there, there were certain elements of them that were not good or that nothing good dwelled within them. OK, I, 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 I mean, I think to say that that uh, and, and that an unbeliever wouldn't say that um, is kind of you, you, you can't really go that direction because, again, you have to understand the context of what's being talked about here from a from a very Jewish perspective. And again, he, Paul is appealing uh, uh, in a lot of ways to the Jews. And, it, it, and even at the beginning of chapter seven, he says, for I'm speaking to those who know the law, those who know the law, most of them would be Jews. And I think some Gentiles would know too, um, perhaps not as well, but I mean, that's, that's another speculation that we don't need to get into right now. But um, so it, just given the, the, the cultural context of what we're dealing with here, are we to say that a, an unbelieving Jew couldn't think or say in their own heart and in their own mind that nothing good lives in them, uh, that is, in their flesh. I, I don't think that's too far gone. That's what the, that's what the sacrificial system was, was supposed to, well, one of the things, not the exclusive thing, but one of the things that the sacrificial system was supposed to demonstrate, that's one of the things that was supposed to be shown to that Jewish worshiper, is that you are sinful and restitution needs to be made. Right. But aside from that, though, I mean, that's just that's just one point, but that's really not the main point that I want to make as it relates to that. Beyond that, though, what we have to understand here is that is what Paul is actually trying to what Paul is actually trying to communicate here in this portion and in the rest of chapter seven. OK, what you have going on here. Um, well, let me let me here's a good this is a good time to to use the example that an, an example that I was eager to use here um, as it relates to all of this. And I'm going to, this is a good time to actually just kind of do a shameless plug for my book, Signs of the End, which I hadn't done in a while, the shameless plug. So maybe I should do it now here because I'm going to bring this into the discussion. Uh, my book, Signs of the End, what did Jesus say about his own return and the events that point to it? Um, a book about Jesus' words to his disciples in the Olivet Discourse. You can get that at Amazon.com or BarnesandNoble.com. Um, I've been leaving the the uh, the um, 
the actual uh, web page, the, the direction to, to go to that um, in the episode descriptions. Um, but I did a shameless plug for my book in just about every episode when we were going through the book of Revelation and even just the general eschatological topics, um, the episodes where we were doing that. But anyway, now that we have that, uh, that shameless plug, um, those of you who have either listen to the podcast on eschatology that we did not too long ago or read my book or maybe did both, understand where I come from in that whole discussion, um, how I lean more towards amillennial. Well, I don't lean towards. I embrace it. I think that that's the best way to look at Scripture. But I embrace amillennialism, and so therefore this book takes that, that perspective. I approach the Olivet Discourse from that perspective and I don't believe in the dispensational premillennial um, understanding of the end times. Now, with that being said, let's say that somebody were to present you. Let's let's say you. Let's say that some. Let's say that you're somebody who's listened to my podcast. You understand where I stand on eschatological matters, but you haven't read my book. Um, and somebody presents to you a sentence from my book. And uses that sentence to say that I am one who believes in the dispensational premillennial understanding and that I'm somebody who believes that there is an actual seven-year tribulation period. I don't believe that there's an actual seven-year tribulation period. I believe that there will be increasing tribulation. Um, but again, that's a totally a, a total other, a totally other topic. Those of you who are new to the program might hear me say all this and you might drop your jaw and think that I've gone crazy. That's unfortunate if you think if that's your reaction. But um, but you, but those of you who are faithful listeners know where I stand on that. So if somebody comes to you, um, and let's say they, they present this sentence and I'm reading this from my actual, actual sentence from my book and they present this sentence to you that says, once the Holy spirit is taken out of the way, then the man of lawlessness comes thus kicking off the seven year tribulation period. And they say there, you see. Somebody who is a millennial wouldn't write that sentence in there. They wouldn't, you know, so Steve has to be a dispensational premillennialist. He has to be because he, be, and, or at the very least, he believes in the seven year tribulation period because, you know, it says right there, it's, it's written there as a statement of, fa- uh, as a statement of fact, seemingly once the Holy spirit is taken out of the way, then the man of lawlessness comes thus kicking off the seven year tribulation period. Now, anybody who would read the book and even would read that particular sentence would would understand that what I'm doing within that entire paragraph is not laying out statements of fact about about the end times, but I'm in the process in in that area where that sentence shows up. I'm in the process of explaining what dispensational premillennialists believe, okay? I'm not stating my own thought on what I think is eschatological reality. I'm saying this is what dispensationalists believe. And even in previous paragraphs uh, and, and even paragraphs after that, you get the sense that what I'm in the process of doing is explaining what dispensational premillennialists believe. And that's what you would get when you, re- when you read through that. So just taking something and saying, well, no, a millennialist would, would say that. So because he said that, that must mean that he's a dispensational premillennialist would be, would be somewhat silly to, to do. And, and I would say the same thing here. The, the example isn't exact, but it's very similar to what I'm, the point that I'm trying to make here as it relates to Paul's words here in, in chapter 7. You know, where he says, I know for I know that nothing good dwells within dwells in me that is in my flesh to automatically say, well, a believer wouldn't say that. Well, based on what I said a few minutes, a few minutes before, I'd say "Eh, maybe we think that. But even so, beyond that, what you have to understand is what Paul is actually in the process of doing. He's in the process of, of providing a portrait and a demonstration of what life for somebody who lives under the old way of the written code, what that looks like. And what he's going to be working towards is this, is this situation of somebody who is an unbeliever who's living under the old way of the written code, what it looks like, what the thought process looks like to the ideal end of them coming to the end of themselves 
and realizing their need for Jesus Christ as their Savior. Okay. Now, in Paul laying this out and going and taking us in that process, this isn't him saying that this is what happens for everybody who identifies themselves as people under the, uh, under the, under the old way of the written code. Obviously, that's not the case. Obviously, that's not the case, right? Just look at the, look at the New Testament Gospels. Look at the Pharisees. Look at the Sadducees. We obviously know that that's not the case. But what he's doing is that he's, he's by, by putting the two perspectives side by side with the old way of the written code and the new way of the spirit, what he's doing is looking at the helplessness of the old way of the written code so that ideally, and by the work of the spirit, the, the convicting work of the spirit, because, you know, everything with salvation is, is divinely initiated. You know, we take somebody who is under that old way of the written code coming to the end of themselves and coming into the new and better way of the spirit. In other words, someone who transitions from an unbeliever who is not justified under the law and somebody who, somebody who is a believer who's justified in Christ. Okay. And so when he says there, for I have the desire to do what is right, but not, but not the ability to carry it out. Why does he say that? Well, he goes on to explain that in verse 19. Because his way of trying to do better has proved to fail over and over and over again. So he's able to make that statement in verse 18 because his utter inability to live up to the, dicta the, the, the requirements of the law have failed over and over again. Verse 19, for or because I do not do the good I want, but the evil I do not want is what I keep on doing. That's why he says there's something good that lives within me. So this is the thought process that's going on with somebody who's in that helpless cycle, who thinks that the law is all that there is. The law is it. That's where it is. And then after a while, as he continues to fail and fail and fail, it says, you know what? Nothing good lives in, within my flesh. And I can say that because I keep trying to live by, by the requirements of the law and it's not working out. Verse 20 says, now, if I do what I do not want, there's no longer I who do it, but sin that dwells with, dwells within me. That's just a repeat of what he's said one or two times before in previous verses there. So now he comes in, in, at the end, this ending part of, of chapter seven in this concluding um, sort of, um, uh, you know, analysis, let's say, let's call it that. He says, so I find in it, I, I find it to be a law that when I want to do right, evil lies close at hand. For I delight in the law of God in, uh, 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 <laughs> for I delight in the law of God in my inner being, but I see in my members another law waging war against, uh, against the law of my mind and making me captive to the law of sin that dwells in my members. Now, a couple of things. Number one, here's, here's one of the areas where, where, people might object to the position that I hold in verse 22, where it says, for I delight in the law of God in my inner being. And so again, it comes to the whole thing of, well, an unbeliever doesn't, doesn't delight in the law of God. You know, so this has to be Paul as a believer because an unbeliever wouldn't say I delight in the law of God. But again, you have to understand the context with which we're dealing. If we're dealing with predominantly Jews who are trying to live under the law, and even if we're talking about the case of Judaizers, which isn't the case here in Romans, but even so, if we're talking about Galatians, we're talking about Jews who are trying to convince Gentiles that the law is where it's at. Okay. You might have people say, you know, Gentiles saying, okay, if that's what it is, then I want to do what is right. And I delight in the law because I'm being told that it's through the law that I become closer to God. But whatever the case, I mean, if we're just looking exclusively here within the Jewish context, you know, that, of course, you would have Jews of all sorts who are religious and who would say that they delight in the law. If, if time travel were possible and I were able to jump into my DeLorean um, and go back to the times of Christ or even around then, maybe even before, maybe even a little bit after and, and tour the, and tour, uh, uh, Jerusalem and other places in Palestine and talk to Jews. And I were to take a poll and I were to ask, and I was, and I were to ask religious Jews this question. Do you delight in the law? Do you honestly think that, that 
a large majority of those people say, no, I don't delight in the law at all. I can't stand the law. I despise the law. The law, yuck. I can't stand it. Do you think that that the, the typical religious Jew at that time would have said that? No, they wouldn't have. The law is all that they've known. The law is what they grew up on. They delight in the law. A lot of people were very passionate about the law. Okay. So again, it's a, it's a matter of a context and what we're dealing with and who we're dealing with. I mean, we even, we even are exposed to this whole thing where, um, where Paul says, I mean, if you were to flip forward, um, in Romans to chapter 10, um, in verse two, where he says, for I bear them witness that they, and he's talking about Jews, just regular Jews, they have a zeal for God. Now, wait a minute though. So are we, are we going to say then that these Jews that Paul is talking about who reject Christ are actually really believers because no one believer would have a zeal for God, right? No one believe. would we really say that? No, many Jews had a, had a, and, and even Paul says, I, for I bear them witness that they have a zeal for God. But what's the problem though? But not according to knowledge. So it's a zeal, but it's a misplaced zeal. They have, they say they have a, a zeal for God, but it's, ba- but it's not based on knowledge. So it's a zeal that at the end of the day really doesn't do any good. Right. So you can't say, you know, you know, somebody could easily say an unbeliever wouldn't have a zeal for God. Well, who are we talking about here? Are we talking about religious Jews? Well, yeah, religious Jews who didn't know Christ had a zeal for God. And in the same way, I think you could say that religious Jews who didn't know Christ have a desire, have a delight in the law of God. But the thing is, they say the law is actually where it's at and through the law is where, is, is my, is where my justification is. And that's not the case. Think of it like this. Even outside of the Jewish world, whether we're talking about ancient or present, you ever heard somebody say um, that there, there are going to be a lot of religious people in hell? Do you agree with that statement? I do. There are a lot of people who... You know, they say, I go to church, I attend Sunday school, I do this, I do that, I get to charity, blah, blah, blah. Um, And at the end of the day, they end up in hell. Why? Because it really wasn't about God. It really wasn't about Christ. They never, they never surrendered to Christ. I mean, even Jesus said in in Matthew chapter seven, many of you will say to say to me on that day, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name and drive out many demons and so forth and so on? He's going to say, I never knew you depart from me you workers of lawlessness, right? But they were doing religious things, right? I think many of us would agree, and again, this doesn't even have to be reduced only to the Jewish world, just even outside of that world, uh, outside of that realm, we'd say that there are many, um, many uh, religious people who are in hell. Now, would we say that these were people who just say, you know, things of God, you know, uh, God, Jesus, ugh, yuck, you know, it, you know, I, yeah, I, I, just whatever. Not necessarily. And, and you know, so you, I, hopefully you, you see what I'm what I'm saying here. I mean, the mere fact that many of us believe that there will be religious people and by religious people, I mean, people who, who live their lives with religion may go to church and and do all sorts of things, but have no concept of life in Christ or anything like that at all. Um, you know, that, you know, they, that, that, that somehow you see what I'm saying? It, even, think about this. And I know I'm, I'm being long winded here, but I'm, another example just came to mind. Just think about this. Think about the Roman centurion in Acts chapter 10. It said that he feared God and that he gave to the poor, right? Seems like a pretty good dude. But at that time, was he a believer? No. Now I think there was a lot of Jewish influence. He had a lot of in Jewish influence in the Jewish in the Jewish religion, but it was incomplete. So the fact that somebody feared God, you know, said, well, no unbeliever would ever say that he feared God or or anything like that. Well, hold on a second here. Who are we talking about? What are we dealing with? What are what are the what are the circumstances that we're dealing with? You know, we, we think about unbelievers and we have this mindset, this idea in our mind is, okay, an unbeliever. We have the, the militant atheists or you just have the people in the West or in the United States who go about their daily lives. They cuss up a storm. They beat their spouses. They, you know, they, they do all sorts of, th- you know, all these, these things. They sleep around. They do drugs and, you know, all, you know, our imaginations go wild. 
and we imagine us bringing up, up the things of God to them and they and them laughing in our faces and saying, get away from us. We don't want to hear about God or the things of God and that sort of thing. And so therefore, when we're exposed to something like this here, where it says, for I delight in the law of God, we automatically think, oh, an unbeliever wouldn't say that because we only have one thought of a, of a, of a view of what an unbeliever would look like or how an unbelie- unbeliever would behave. But you can't do that, okay? What is what has Paul been been pointing out and when throughout this whole process as we've been going through this whole thing in, in in Romans? It's it's really been from a Jewish context. And again, I would ask you, if you took a poll of ancient Jews back in the days of Jesus and asked them, "Do you delight in the law of God?" Do you honestly think that they would say no? Of course, they wouldn't say no. They really did delight in God's law, right? So that's the point that we really need to make there. But he so but he says there, he says, For I delight in the law of God in my inner being, but I see in my members another law waging war against the law of my mind. And, you know, the to- whole thing of mind, you know, I think centers around the whole thing of what I am now aware of being exposed to the law and understanding what is required of me and what I need to do. All right waging war against the law of my mind and making me captive to the law of sin that dwells in my members. Now, did you notice something here? Because he said, um, I delight in the law uh, in the law of God in my inner being, but I see in my members, you know, so inwardly I have a delight in God's law, but it's not being expressed outwardly as it should. Because he says, uh, but I see in my members, outwardly, in other words, expressed in actions through my body and everything like that, another law waging war against the law of my mind. What is that? What is that? uh, What is that law? He says there at the end of verse 23, the law of sin. There it is. The law of sin that dwells in my members. Okay. And the fact that this, uh, this affects quote unquote, my members as, as Paul is saying is, is very significant as well. Because again, Again, if you go back to the earlier part of this chapter, where he says in verse five, for while we were living in the flesh, while we were living in the flesh, in other words, when we were unbelievers, when we were living in the flesh, our sinful passions aroused by the law. And again, we saw how he described that later on in that chapter, later on in the chapter, our sinful passions aroused by the law were at work in our members to bear fruit for death. That is the unbeliever under the old way of the written code, right? So that's what he's laying out there in this summary, in this summary section here at the end of, uh, at the end of chapter seven. And so in verses, verse 24 is the demonstration of words that are expressed from somebody who ideally seeing the helplessness and the futility of life under the old way of the written code comes to the end of himself. And he says, wretched man that I am, who will deliver me from this body of death? That's a, that's a, that's a, that's a, that's a term of death, desperation. It seems like he looks, he says, I am just awful and I need rescuing. That's why he asks who will, who will deliver me from this body of death? The answer to that question is right there in verse 25. Thanks be to God through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Jesus Christ has been the point of this whole thing, folks. Salvation in him, justification in Christ and not by the law. That's the point he's been making this whole time. He says, so then I myself serve the law of God with my mind. Again, having a knowledge of what the law says, right? And wanting to do what it says. Now that I know what's required of me. But my, but with my flesh, I serve the law of sin with my flesh. And then the flesh, again, it's just another way of saying the sinful nature. That sinful nature, by the way, as it's been described, is a, is a nature that is unregenerate, right? And that's, what's been, that's what has been demonstrated. So in all of chapter 7, Paul has been, Paul has been, um, has been taking us in, in, the pro, in the thought process of the ideal of what it would be if somebody under the under the old way of the written code seeing the futility of it and then realizing their need for something different or someone different and somebody coming to the end of themselves who will rescue me from this body of death glad you ask 
Thanks be to, good, uh, to God through our Lord Jesus Christ. There's the answer. He is the answer. Salvation in Christ essentially is what he's, is what he's saying. And when he's saying, who will rescue me from this body of death? I mean, he, he's going to bring up the hope of the redemption of our bodies later on in, later on in chapter 8. We'll talk about that just a little bit because I know we've, we've gone a long time here. But let me, let me go into chapter 8 a little bit here. And we're not, we don't have to, I don't think we have to spend as much time here, but hopefully if we read through a lot of this stuff here, you'll see the point that's being made here. If you remember what I said in verse six of chapter seven, we're talking about the new way of the spirit versus the old way of the written code. And if you remember everything that we talked about last time leading up to that point, and even a lot of the stuff that we've talked about now, we understand that we're making, that we're talking about a distinction between a believer and an unbeliever. Okay. And so now when laying out the whole thing of the old way, the, the new way of the spirit versus the old way of the written code, he demonstrates what the old way of the written code is all about. Now we get into chapter eight and he highlights the new way of the spirit. So he says, there, there is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. For the, now listen, for the law of the spirit of life has set you free in Christ Jesus from the law of sin and death. So remember, listen, all of this is in Christ Jesus. For the law of the spirit of life, right? There's the spirit. So now we're getting into the new way of the spirit. And that law of the spirit of life has set us free. What does that mean? That that goes back to what we've been talking about in chapter 6. That if you are a believer and if you're in Christ, you are no longer a slave to sin. You've been set free in Christ Jesus, Right? From the law of sin and death. What is what have we been talking about in chapter 7? The law of sin and death. So if we've been set free from the law of sin and death, and the law of sin and death is what's been demonstrated in chapter 7, how can Paul be talking about his experience of, with sin as a believer? You see what I'm saying? He's highlighting the distinction of the new way of the Spirit now after talking about the old way of the written code. Verse three of chapter eight, he says, for God has done it for God has done what the law weakened by the flesh could not do. Now, why was that? Why was the law? Why was the law weakened by the flesh? Because, again, all the law did was make you aware of sin. And then it made you and then it, it brought up all these sinful de- desires. Remember Paul's uh, example of covetousness. I learned what coveting was through the law, but all of these covetous desires came up within me. And then it says, he says that sin sees the opportunity to, you know, so forth and so on. We went through all, all that whole thing, the law. So God did what the law was not able to do. The law was weakened by the flesh because the flesh, you know, again, if you're in the flesh, you're under the dominion of sin. And if you're under the dominion of sin, sin is your master and your master calls the shots. And tells you what to do. Weakened by the flesh could not do. By sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh. And that's not saying that he himself was sin, was a sinful man. He came in, he came in the likeness of sinful flesh. In other words, he came in as a man. Right? And if you look at places like Hebrews chapter 2, it says that he had to be made like his brothers. In other words, he had to be made like flesh and blood. So... I keep pausing here. Let me let me go back to the beginning of the sentence here. So by sending his uh, his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh and for sin, he condemned sin in the flesh in order that the righteous requirements of the law might be full uh, might be fulfilled in us. Now, I, I mentioned part of what that looks like. And again, as I said, as I said before, what Paul said earlier is that we uphold the law Um he said that he said that earlier. Now in Christ, what we do is that we uphold the law and we could rightfully ask the question. OK, so what does that look like? How does that how do we uphold the law? That, by the way, is chapter three, verse thirty one, where he says, do we overthrow the law by this faith? By no means. On the contrary, we uphold the law. Right. Now, one is in a passive sense, in the sense that we, the righteous requirements of the law are met in us because Christ met those requirements and and imputed his righteousness into our sin account so that legally and forensically we are declared righteous so the righteous requirements of the law are met but 
it has enough, this uh, that is just forensic but there's also something else that happens that affects the way that we live that's even seen even besides the whole thing of justification and that's in the rest of that sentence there in, in verse 4 he says who walk not according to the flesh is what people tried to do before but according to the sin uh, excuse me but according to the spirit notice who walk according to the spirit not according to not according to the flesh okay we walk in that way that's the new way of the spirit okay and just as just as uh just as chapter 6 said uh remember um in verse 4 it says we were buried therefore with him by baptism into death in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the father we too might walk walk how or in what walk in newness of life that is the new way of the spirit which only characterizes a believer so the distinctions that are being made there should be obvious now should they not paul in chapter 7 was talking about the old way of the written code here in chapter 8 he's talking about the new way of the spirit by the way he says um in uh in verse uh in verse 9 you however are not in the flesh but in the spirit if if in fact the spirit of god dwells in you now listen rest of the verse anyone who does not have the spirit of christ does not belong to christ therefore what we would say is that if you don't have the spirit you're not a christian now if you have come to christ and you are a christian then you receive the holy spirit right so this whole thing of the new way of the new way of the spirit is something where the spirit is given to us and as we walk in the spirit we walk in a way that we weren't able to before under the old way of the written code the old way of the written code was just frustration and futility trying to find righteousness in any in anything other than Jesus Christ right now let me just take your your attention up a few verses here um where it says, uh, do, 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 do. well, let me just, uh, we'll just, we'll start in verse five. I, I, I presented verse four. Let me read through uh, verse five and following. It says, for those who live according to the flesh set their minds on the things of the flesh, but those who live according to the spirit set their minds on the things of the spirit. For to set the mind on the flesh is death, but, the, uh, but to set the mind on the spirit is life and peace. For... Now, here, here we're going to, this is very important territory here. For the mind that is set on the, on the flesh is hostile to God. For, listen, listen, for it does not submit to God's law. Indeed, it cannot. What did we, what did we hear Paul talking about in his demonstration? Remember, because he was in the process of explaining. This wasn't him talking about himself. He's in the process of explaining what this looks like what this life looks like in the old way of the written code. Remember what he says? He says uh, in verse 18, for I know that nothing good dwells in me that is in my flesh, for I desire to do what is right, but not the ability to carry it out. What is described there is what we see here in chapter 8, verse 7. It says the mind that is set on the, on the flesh is hostile to God, it does not submit to God's law. Indeed, it cannot. That's Romans chapter 7. Those who are in the flesh cannot please God. But again, the contrast, and again, I just read this a few minutes ago, but again, just so you can see the connection here, you see that there that I just read in verses 5 through 7, uh, excuse me, 5 through 8, but then the contrast, remember again, we keep saying, we keep seeing contrasts here. The contrast here is in verse 9. You, however, are not in the flesh. He, he's talking to his audience as, as believers, but in the Spirit, if in fact the Spirit of God dwells in you, right? So if he is in you, as you as you would go on to say, you belong to Christ. If you don't have the Spirit within you, then that means you, you don't belong to Christ, right? So what does that tell us? Because again, it says anyone who does not have the Spirit of Christ does not belong to him. He's not a Christian. He's not a believer. So all these distinctions and the distinguishing factors that are being made here shows us that we're talking about the descriptions of an unbeliever versus a believer. Somebody who walks in the old way of the written code as opposed to somebody who walks in the spirit. Okay. 
If the spirit of him who raised him from the dead dwells in you, he who raised Christ from uh, Christ Jesus from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies through his spirit who dwells in you. Okay? So there again, and again, that ties back to the whole thing of wretched man that I am who will deliver me from this body of death. And then in verse, in verse 25, he says, thanks be to God through Jesus Christ our Lord. Because it's through Jesus Christ that all of that is possible. And we see, and we receive the spirit and that's going and that's going to lead us into you know to the the here and now the promises that we have in the here and now of our sanctification which will ultimately have the end result when Christ comes back to our glorification now i don't have time to go through everything here but i'm going to skip over to verse 18 and following of chapter 8 because it says, for I consider that the sufferings of this present age are not worth comparing with the glory that is to be revealed to us. For the creation waits in eager, uh, with eager longing for the revealing of the sons of God. And we, under, we understand, and we actually went through this when we were talking about the new heavens and the new earth when we, when we came up to Revelation chapter 21. We were going over that. You remember in our study of the book of Revelation? This is all pointing to the eternal state and what we're looking forward to when Christ comes back. You know, it says, for the creation waits in eager longing for the revealing of the sons of God. For the creation was subjected to futility, not willingly, but because of him who subjected it, in hope that the creation itself will be set free from its bondage to corruption and obtain the freedom of the glory of the children of God. See all that? You even have the slave language there, bondage, freedom, and that sort of thing. Verse 22, for we know that the whole creation has been growing, groaning together in the pains of childbirth until now. And not only the creation, but we ourselves who have the first fruits of the spirit grown inwardly as we wait eagerly for the adoption of uh, adoption as sons, the redemption of our bodies. So we are gro- we, gr- uh, we groan inwardly for that time as we wait eagerly for the uh, our, for adoption as sons, the redemption of our bodies. That's the resurrection that happens at the end when Christ comes back. Okay, but with that in mind, though, notice what that what it says earlier in that verse. This is in verse uh, verse twenty three. Um, uh, let's see, and not only the creation, but we ourselves. Listen, who have the first fruits of the spirit? What is that? What is he talking about? He's talking about the first fruits of the spirit. He's talking about sanctification there. The, the sanctifying work that proves itself out, it proves itself uh, that presents itself as the spirit works in us. And as we begin to see progressive change through sanctification, that's first fruits of the spirit. That's the first fruits of the spirit. Now, first fruits was a, is a concept of a, a, a first installment of a, of a crop that gar- that that's a first installment of a future crop that's guaranteed later on down the road. So the first fruit of the Spirit, if that's a reference to sanctification, which I think a lot of theologians would agree that that's what Paul is referring to there, what we have now as we are progressively being transformed is a first fruits that points to the reality, the future hope of what we have at redemption and when Christ comes back, when we are, when we are rescued from this body of death. So the whole cry at the end of, of, of chapter 7, who will rescue me from this body of death, is, is, the, is the cry of somebody who is at the end of himself. And then Paul introduces us to the better way that the person who is at the end of themselves can, uh, then can, can come into salvation through Jesus Christ. When they come to Christ, they get the Spirit, the Holy Spirit. When we walk according to the Spirit and not according to the flesh, and as the spirit works in us, right, we had the first fruits, in other words, the first semblances of the manifestations of, of the spirit as we walk in him, right, that points to the future reality of our redemption, the adoption of sons, the redemption of our bodies. So you see the whole element of sanctification there. That's, again, what we looked at in chapter 6 when there was a, when there was a contrast being made, Remember? But what fruit did, uh, were you getting at that time from the things of which you are now ashamed? For the end of those things is death. But now that you have been set free from sin and have become slaves to God, the fruit did you get leads to sanctification and its end eternal life. Okay. 
Now, the fact that we have the spirit, and we're, and we're almost done here. Again, like I said, this this I wanted to bring these things up to you know to show you just kind of again. It kind of gives us more of a vivid picture of what we're dealing with here in Galatians, especially as it relates to what we saw a couple of weeks ago in verse ten. But I want you to notice something here as well, and this is this is where we're gonna this is in the passage that we're gonna look at next episode next time when we get back into the book of Galatians. But um, in verse. So let's see. Let me, let me start in verse 13. It says Galatians 3 in verse 13. It says, Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law by becoming a curse for us. For it is written, cursed is everyone who is hanged on a tree. Verse 14, so that in Christ Jesus, the blessing of Abraham might come to the Gentiles so that we might receive the promised spirit through faith. Okay. So do you see the connection there? And notice, and again, in Romans, it talked about how we no longer walk according to the flesh, but we walk according to the spirit. Okay. And that's how the, how, that's how the law is, is fulfilled. Again, not perfectly. We're not claiming perfection here. The perfection is not going to come until the redemption of our bodies. But again, with sanctification, we're seeing, we're seeing improvement. Now, sometimes, you know, as a, as a, our main teaching pastor said in a, in a sermon last week, um, you know, it feels like it feels like two steps forward and three steps back. I get that. I understand that. And that's not to deny that at all. You know, that is that is tr- certainly a reality. But again, what we see here, though, is that instead of in chapter seven, we see somebody who's in the futility of living under the old way of the written code. And just trying and trying and trying and trying, uh, you know, to live according to the requirements of the law and falling every time in the spirit, we actually see progress. We see progressive sanctification. Again, if it's progress and it's not something that's immediate, obviously we're going to have moments where we slip, where we fall, where we sin and that sort of thing. So, again, we're not talking about perfection. And that's and that's really what you get into in Galatians chapter five. And I just want to point this out really quick here. Because, you know, it's Paul is going to talk about this whole thing of the spirit, but he says, but I say, walk in the walk by the spirit and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. Now, take that verse compared to everything that we've talked about in Romans. If we're talking about somebody as, as described by Paul in, in chapter seven. If indeed we're talking about some, a description of somebody who's who's walking in the old way of the written code. You know, or actually, let me put it this way. Instead of Paul painting himself as a helpless Christian, seemingly, who says, I man, I just I just wanted you right, but I just keep failing and failing and failing and failing. I would just say, why doesn't Paul just take his own advice here in Galatians 5, uh, 5, 16? But I say, walk by the spirit and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. You know why that doesn't come up in the in the in the discussion at that point in in Romans chapter seven, because he's describing the unbeliever, the unbeliever who doesn't have the spirit, and if they don't have the spirit, they can't go by something like what we see here in Galatians chapter five, right? Now there is a struggle, and I think that there is a difference here between a struggle and slavery. Much of what Paul is majoring on in Romans chapter six and chapter seven is slavery. If somebody is a slave, they, you know, in a, in a, in a broad sense, you're not really talking about struggle. Technically, maybe there is a struggle. You're struggling for freedom, but your master is just stronger than you. Right. If we want to put it that way, perhaps maybe, I don't know. I have to think about that a little bit, but here we're talking about in Galatians chapter five. There is an acknowledgement that there is a a, 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 a a struggle. In verse 17, it says, For the desires of the flesh are against the Spirit. Notice the Holy Spirit, who the believer has and the unbeliever doesn't have. And, he, and the desires of the Spirit are against the flesh, for these are opposed to each other to keep you from doing the things you want to do. So yeah, there is, there is that reality. But as he says in verse 16, you know, it's essentially saying, you know, 
this is why you need to walk by the spirit. And the, and somebody can walk by the spirit that o- that can only be done by a believer. And Paul even says as much in chapter eight of Romans of Romans. We walk not according to the flesh, but according to the spirit. And then even later in Galatians five, he says, if you if we live by the spirit, let us keep in step with the spirit. That is not something that you can say to somebody under the old way of the written code. And again, when we make the comparison between chapter seven and chapter eight, you see, you see that essentially what it comes down to is the is the difference between a believer and an unbeliever. Okay, so hopefully, and hopefully this is, does a good job of setting the stage for again for when we get back into Galatians chapter three, because where we left off, we, we were left off with a pretty heavy duty curse there, again. Paul talking to Gentile churches who are starting to be influenced by Judaizers who are saying, hey, Christ isn't enough. You need circumcision and you need the law. Paul's one saying, do you understand what, 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 what's, under the, what's, what's under the law? First of all, there's a curse. Somebody who is cursed who does not continue to do all of those things. Continue to do all of those things. And what I'm trying to show to you, show you now, and even last week, is that even, even when you try, all it is is helplessness and futility, which makes the reality of the curse all the more apparent, right? Hopefully, somebody would be able to see that. But as we're going to see next time, once we get back into Galatians chapter three, you see the magnificence, the magnificence of salvation in Christ because of what Christ has done. It's beautiful. It's absolutely beautiful and wonderful. And I think that that is, that is a message that, that, you know, that we need to embrace wholeheartedly, even as believers. I mean, we understand what Christ did, but that story, that message never gets old. And I prefer that story over what a lot of people are being convinced to believe in Romans chapter seven. Oh, I'm just a, I'm just a helpless Christian. I sin all the time. I do what I do not want to do. No, that's da. Ah, leave that leave that off. That's not that's not describing you. And again, not saying that you're perfect. Not saying that there aren't times where you feel like you're in that cycle of sin. But you do have the spirit and you do have that command because you have the spirit. You can be somebody who walks by the spirit. And Paul says in Galatians five, if you walk by the spirit, you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. And that doesn't sound like somebody who's in a helpless state. Okay. So I hope all of that makes sense. I hope all of that, you know, bringing all of that together really brings clarity to you. Um, How well I, I presented my case Um, I don't know. I'll just leave that up to you to decide. Um, But I will say this, um, mull over what I said, continue to study the the, the text of Romans chapter seven and eight. And I would even say, and even if you've done this a couple of times already, I would say read chapters one through eight again. No harm in doing that. And if you can, if you can preferably do it in one sitting, but um but as long as you read through it, whether it's through one sitting or not, I think I think it would be advantageous for you. OK, so we're going to leave our, our discussion of Romans behind now. And, let, and as I said, next time, we're going to jump back in to our, our, our study in the book of Galatians, having come to the end of our semi break. And so now we're going into um, uh, we're going to pick up in chapter three, verse 11. Um, and go through chapter, uh, chapter, uh, verses 11 through 14. We'll probably talk a little bit, you know, just spend a small time again, just talking about some things just as a review, um, of things that we talked about when we were looking at verse 10, but the main focus is going to be on verses 11 through 14. I believe it's verse, uh, I think, I believe verse 14 is the last verse there in that section that we're going to look at, but we'll be back in Galatians next, uh, next time. I'm looking forward to it. I hope you're looking forward to it as well. All right. So we will leave it there. I know that I was long winded on this one and I I had a feeling um, coming into this time that it probably would be. Um, And I was debating in my mind of possibly splitting this up into two into two episodes. But I really wanted to have next time have us going back into into Galatians. So that's why I was kind of 
stubborn and and dug my heels into 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 uh in, into doing all of this and covering everything in chapter seven and, and chapter eight that I wanted to cover. Um, but anyway, we'll leave it there. Um, if you enjoy the show and you haven't done so already, I would encourage you to subscribe to my show on Apple Podcasts, also on iHeartRadio, YouTube, Spotify. Um, and uh, you can also follow me, uh, me, Steve Gill, on Twitter. Handle is at LT Scripts. That's L T S E R I P T S which stands for Loving the Scriptures, and also my other account, at LT Scripts Pod. That's L-T-S-E-R-I-P-T-S-P-O-D. And since I brought it up before, I might as well bring it up again, do another shameless plug. And I, I might do the shameless plug a little bit more again, pick that up again so that people become aware of it more in case there are new listeners that are coming on the show. But again, don't forget to order a copy of my book if you haven't done so already, Signs of the End, What Did Jesus Say About His Own Return, and the events that point to it. Again, Amazon.com and BarnesNoble.com are the main places where you can pick up a copy of that. Read it and be blessed. And don't forget that if you enjoy the show and think it will be a blessing to other people, be sure to tell other people about loving the scriptures. Fa- friends, family members, uh, you know, just whoever, you, you know, small group, church members, that sort of thing. So um, let's all get into uh, the wonderful joy of examining God's word together. I think that would be really neat. Anyway, all right, we are finally bringing an end to this episode. Had a great time um, examining things. I hope you had a good time in the scriptures as well. My name is Steve Gill, and I will see you right back here next time. Bye now.